Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. Amen. The Lord, I bless us the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. Thou shalt be saved. Anybody saved in this place today? Has anybody ever had a time in their life where they had to yield to this scripture? And you confessed. And you asked God to save you. And he, you quoted this scripture. You said it in some kind of way. Anybody in here know what that feels like? When God delivered you from yourself. When he delivered you from your sins and delivered you from damnation. Amen. That is a great day. Amen. For all of us. Now there's going to be more scriptures I'm going to come from. But this is our starting scripture. And we're going to talk about salvation today. Salvation. What does it actually mean to be saved? What is salvation? You know, we sometimes in life we hear so many variations of things, and maybe perhaps our view of salvation comes from predetermined uh, idea, something that you've been taught traditionally, uh, whether right or whether off a little bit. Uh, sometimes we've been influenced by other cultural things concerning salvation what we've seen on TV, what we grew up with, certain denominations, their various different ways that they, what they classify, what it means to be saved. But one thing that is sure that I do know, the truth, this book of truth, will always answer every question that you ever have. Whatever you want to know, you can look in this book, amen? It doesn't matter what people say, it doesn't matter about their opinions. It doesn't matter about what they think. Because the Bible says don't put your trust in your own self and to your own thoughts. But your trust ought to be in what the Bible says concerning the matter. About what it means to be saved. I remember a long time ago, and it's probably back in the 90s. Man, we were on Landmark, we was on Bluffton Road, and we were doing some type of youth thing, I can't remember now. I know I was probably about 20-ish at that time. And I know we were in a van, we had picked up a bunch of kids. I can't remember what we were doing. We, so I was just sitting in the back, and there were some kids that maybe were younger, you know, obviously uh, maybe 11, 10 or 11, uh, this young boy. He was sitting there, I don't even know how the conversation came up, but I mentioned, I'm saved. Man, because I got saved as a young man, got saved actually when I was a junior in high school at Old Landmark Church of God in Christ on Bluffton Road, all the way back in 1990-ish, I believe. <laughs> right around there, yeah, 91. And um, so I was saved, and I forgot what the conversation was that got brought up, but I said, I'm saved. And the young boy asked a serious question in his mind it was serious it was it was really he said save from what because I just said I'm saved and he said save from what and when I think about this today it does make sense for someone to ask that question that may not even know what salvation is because we see salvation so many different ways. Is it, is it just, is it suddenly just the way of life? Or is, is it just the fact that you come to church? Is it just the fact that you say you believe that there is a God? Is it just the fact that your, your, your grandmother was saved and you was brought up in church and your mama was saved and you was brought up in church? Is it just the physical coming to church? Is it just the idea of you lifting up your hands, praising and, and, and uh, being a part of the service? What is salvation and what does it really mean to be saved. And he asked me a question. He said, saved from what? And I remember being that young. I really 
wasn't sure exactly how to answer that because I just knew I was saved. But I really didn't know how to explain my salvation. And sometimes we know what we are, we feel it. But when someone asks you who has no idea, are you able to tell them what actually is salvation? What does it actually mean? Is it rules? <clears throat> that when you come to church, you got to do this, got to do that, got to do A, B, and C. And I mean, it, it, is it a pattern? Is it a way of life? What actually is salvation? So that question that he asked, what are we saved from? Well, first of all, we have to go back to a little history. If you go back to Genesis, read the story of Genesis, the creation, and God created man perfect and in his image. Yes. But after a time, there was a devil that fell from heaven. Mm -hmm. And that devil decided, because I'm angry, because I got fired. I'm angry because I got kicked out. So what's going to be my purpose? I'm going to mess up God's plan. I'm going to mess up his perfect creation. So the devil comes in and he tempts the woman, Eve. Then Eve turns around and presents it to Adam. And they both fail for it. And so now we have the fall of man, what's known as the fall of mankind. At that point, when Adam disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. And it corrupted all of God's creation. Whatever the earth and nature was supposed to be, it got corrupted at the time sin came in. Whatever mankind, whatever we as human beings were supposed to be, it was corrupted the minute Adam disobeyed. And what is sin? It is transgression against God's law. Whatever his law is, if you transgress that or disobey, then that is sin. And the term sin itself is an archery term because if you're an archer and you try to shoot something and you're trying to hit a target, if you missed, they called it sin because you missed the mark. So sin means to miss the mark. What mark? Whatever God has established. Whatever his law that he established, that is the mark that we must hit and maintain. Y'all follow with me so far? And Adam had one mark he had to hit, one rule that he was given. He said, every tree I have given you to eat from, but this one tree I'm commanding and making a law that you do not eat from. Isn't it amazing how it doesn't matter how much stuff you have, how much is around you. There's always that one thing that you want that you can't have. Come on, preacher. Isn't it amazing that it's something in the human psyche that when you can't have it, you want it? I mean, it's almost like when you were growing up as a child, your mother gave you all of this area to play in, all of these toys that she has given you to play with. But the one thing that you're not supposed to touch, that flesh says, huh, I wonder why I can't touch it. I wonder why it's separated over here. I know I got all of this over here, but mm, I'm curious about this one thing over here. And that is the interesting thing about the human mind and our flesh. We always desire what we cannot have. And what we have, we misuse and look over. And we don't think about what God actually has given us. We don't think about the joy that we actually have. You don't think about what you have in front of you. What's that saying? You don't miss the water until the well runs dry. And sometimes we have a bad habit of overlooking what we actually have. The good of what God has given us. God blesses you with a car you see a better car. God blesses you with a house, you see a newer, bigger house. <laughs> what is it about the next best thing? What is it about the thing that you don't have 
that you cannot obtain. Because it's, it's, it's funny how those that are rich who have really discovered the truth of riches are trying to get away. Those that are rich and famous are trying to get away from the crowd. Those of us that are poor and not famous are trying to be rich and famous. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you know why? Because it's a lack of understanding the position in life in which you are. Because when you're at one point of life, all you see is what's around you. All you see is your problems being magnified. All you see is what you don't have and what you would like to have. But the only reason you would like to have it is because somebody put an image in your head that said that you should have it. And Adam and Eve were content until the devil introduced an image, introduced an idea. And he came to them and says, you know what? Are you sure God said that the day that you eat of this one tree, you will surely die? Are you sure that's what he said? Don't you want it? Don't you, aren't you curious why God said don't eat it? Don't you want to know what happens if you bite into this? Don't you want to know? And don't you all know that this is how life has been set up to make us fail? Come on, preacher. The one reason why we want the things that we want is because the imagery that is put in our mind, the things that we see, they make it desirable. They always make it better than what normal life is. And what we have to realize is most of the stuff that you see on social media, that you see on TV, is fictitious. It is not real life. I hate to bust somebody's boat, but that is not real life. Amen. I mean, we see beautiful women, but that's not reality. That's not reality. They may actually be beautiful for real, but the way it is magnified, the image of what they tell you what a woman should look like, then now every man feels like he should have that type of woman. And in real life, God has made our women in every fashion, shape, or form, and beauty should be from the eye of the beholder, but if somebody tells you what beauty should be, then your mind is drawn toward that imagery that they put in your head. When they show you an imagery of life, and you think that's what life should be. You think life means that you have to have status, and life means you have to have things. But the reality is, there are just some things that come over time. There are just some things you've got to work for. Because I was told money don't grow on trees. But the imagery of the world makes you think that you can have it. And we'll put ourselves in debt trying to get it. We'll get ourselves in trouble trying to get it. We'll become criminals trying to get it. We'll do whatever it takes to get this false imagery of life. Because people make it look good. The devil always makes it look good. He always want to make it look like something that you desire. And I'm sure Adam and Eve wasn't even thinking about that tree until the devil made it look good. Preach, preach. So when we say what is sin, and in fact one scripture says, do not say that you are tempted of God when you are tempted. Because God does not tempt any man with evil. Or excuse me, God cannot be tempted. Neither does he uh, tempt man with evil. So your temptation does not come from God. God will never put you in that type of test and say, well, God must be testing me. The Bible says he, don't, he will never do that to you. And it had nothing to do with God, the reason Adam and Eve desired that tree. But the writer goes on to say, but you are drawn away of your own lust and your own desire. It's something that you have projected in your own mind that you feel you desire this thing. You feel like you should have it. And so now you are drawn toward it. And the devil keys in on that. And he brings something to us and puts imagery, he puts imagination in you to desire that one thing. Y'all hear what I'm saying here today? We are always drawn to the things that we don't have access to. So moving on, because of that, the fall of man came 
And as time goes forward, then God gave us another law. Another law to govern how we should live, to govern our moral life. Because, because of sin entering into the world, things fell apart. And therefore, this is where we come up to the time of the flood. Things fell apart because of the flood. In fact, the Bible says there was so much evil in the world that man was doing evil continually. From the time of the fall up until the time of Noah, the world was full of evil. So God, the flood comes, destroys all the evil off the world, and he saves eight souls. In a sense, to try to reboot try to restart what got messed up. And we know the whole story. He calls out his people, calls out Israel. Amen. And then it, he gave them a law from, they came from Egypt and they were delivered through the power or through what God had anointed Moses to do. And then we came to the time of Israel and he gave them another law, which is the law of Moses. Yes. Amen. And because of that law, because of the fall of sin and the combination of obeying that law, condemnation came into the world. Because God's righteousness declared that there has to be a judgment for going against God's law. Because this is how holy he is. This is who he is. He's about righteousness. He's about doing right. And that is his law of doing right. And the purpose of the law was to try to steer mankind into righteousness. To try to steer him back to obedience and obeying his word. And it was the law that bought justification. If you obeyed the law and did the works, if you made certain sacrifices, if you did all the things that you could physically do, that bought justification to mankind. In order for you to maintain your justification, you had to consistently perform Listen at me, the works of the law. And because of those works, that's what bought self-justification. It wasn't because of anybody else, it was a work that you had to perform. So now I'm going to read Rev uh, Romans chapter 10, and I'm going to start at verse 1, which leads up to verse 9. And Paul writes, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to the knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves on to the righteousness of God. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses uh, describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that a man doeth those things shall live by them. Amen. So he says, I'm praying for Israel because I don't think they get it. Because they were used to doing things according to the law because they knew that is what self-justification was. If they wanted to be justified, they had to do the acts of the law. Y'all hearing me? They had to do the acts of the law. And that is how they obtained righteousness. And they established their own righteousness. Let me tell you something. When you think that salvation is about your own self-justification, you have missed it. And you have a lack of understanding of what Christ has done for us. Sometimes we think that we have to get it all right first before we come to God. We feel like we have to solve all of our problems first before we come to God. We feel like we got to establish our own sense of righteousness so we base it on the things that were called sin. So we say, if I stop doing that, then I'll be good. If I stop doing this, then I'll be good. If I put this away, if I put that away, if I shift this around, if I stop this and stop that and stop this. Right. And we drive ourselves crazy yes. Yes. trying to stop everything when you have no power on, over it. sin. On, That's why the Bible says we were born into sin. And we have no power over sin. Once sin entered into the world, 
because of the fall of mankind, we were under the penalty of sin. We were under the consequence of sin, and we could not break free from it. We have no power, and yet today you have no power to break free from sin. So stop saying, I'll get this together and get that together before I come to God. Because the work at the cross says now you can boldly come before the throne of God. It is what Christ has done for us that now we can come to him with our sin. We can come to him with our problems. We can come to him with our hangups. Y'all hear what I'm telling y'all here today? It is no more by works. Because if you think you're going to justify yourself by what you wear, well, if I dress in church clothes, then that's going to save me. No. Well, if I stop doing this and I stop doing that. And, we, and it's sad that most people have adopted a ritual type salvation, which actually takes us back to the law. Because when you wanted to be justified under the law, it required works. But now comes Christ. And we are now saved by the law of grace. We are saved by the law of faith. And back to chapter verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God did raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is to be saved from condemnation. Earlier I asked you a question, what are we saved from? Now I had to give you the history because of the fall of man, we were all destined to condemnation. We were all destined to judgment. There is a future judgment coming on mankind. And that judgment is still set. That judgment will still happen. And after the end of all things, after the thousand year reign of Christ, there's going to be one final judgment. And the Bible says that all dead will be raised from the grave. If y'all have been watching Bible study and been teaching a series on the coming of the Lord, you'll understand this. All men must die because of sin. That was a penalty of sin that we died. So, therefore, we live our life and we die. We have accidents. Whatever causes our death, we are subject to death. But at the end of days, there will be a judgment. And all of those that are in the grave, all of those that have lived life from Adam up until that point, whatever that day of judgment is, all mankind, alive or dead, will be judged. Those that are in the grave, God is going to raise them up. He's going to bring them back to life just so they can go to judgment. And every man is judged according to his or her works. And if you are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then your judgment is damnation. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So when somebody asks you, what are you saved from? You're saved from that. Salvation, coming to Christ, confessing the Lord as your Savior, saves you from the future damnation, from the future judgment that is to come. This is what we are saved from. But I thank God for Jesus. Because of Christ, we are now saved from that judgment. Amen. But what you must understand is no more by your works. Because that didn't work. The Bible says the law was made weak because of the flesh. Because sometimes we can do things some of the time right, but not all the time right. And that's what happened under the law. You can do things some of the time right, but they couldn't keep the law because of that desire for that one thing. It's always that one thing that draws you toward doing wrong. Paul said, and I know I quoted a lot, but I just said it because I want you to understand because it really is the true basis. The things that I should be doing, I don't do. The things that I should not be doing, that I do. It's because the weakness of your flesh. 
So how can you self-justify yourself? How can you think that you can perform something that will bring you back to God? Your self-performance is over. Thinking that you can do everything right to get, bring yourself to God and closer to God, that don't work. That's over. That was the law. And as he said, Christ was the end of self-justification. So now we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Now hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to break it down to y'all. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? Christ did the work for us. He became sin for us. He became the sacrifice for all, for us, once and for all times. Just because it was done 2,000 years ago, the blood still works. The salvation plan of Christ still works. And it works all the way up until his coming. The blood of Christ still works. So now we are no longer justified by our own works. So stop trying. I know that's hard for some people to hear because sometimes in traditional times, there were certain things that made you seem to appear that you were saved. The way you dressed, the way you looked, act a certain way, how you came to church, when you came to church, all of that was dictated about your salvation. All that, all the, the, the dress codes, all that was dictated according to your salvation. Now there's more to that, but what I'm trying to help you to understand that those are dead works. That does not justify you. The only way you can be justified is through faith in Jesus Christ. You hear what I'm saying? Faith in Jesus Christ is the only way that you can be justified. So salvation is an escape from God's judgment. So now I'm going to go to Jeremiah. Y'all know me, I like to break it down. If I'm going to preach something to you, I'm going to show it to you in Scripture. All right. Make sure you understand it plainly. Yeah. So now that we are justified by faith, we are justified by what Christ has done for us. We are justified by faith in Him. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant, meant to mention, what I, wanted, what I wanted to say with that. Wait, so that you make sure you understand that. When I say that you are covered under Christ, because Christ did the work, he did the work to justify us, so we are now justified because of his justification. And what connects us with him is our faith in him. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God did all those things, that Christ was raised from the dead, that he was crucified from your sins, you can now be saved. So now... How is it, preacher, then, that I'm saved but I still have faults? How is it that I'm saved but I still have struggles? How is it I'm saved but I'm still messed up sometimes? Because I want, what I want you to understand is when you are covered under God's grace, when you are co covered under the faith of Jesus Christ, if any man has sinned, you have an advocate with the Father. Now you can go to Christ and you can ask for forgiveness. And God is faithful to forgive us of our sins. Now, should you sin, should you try to be better? Yes. But you'll never be that perfect. You'll never be that good. So if this is sin, if this is all God sees in you because he sees the flesh, he sees the weakness of the flesh in you, but what happens is Christ's righteousness covers that. The righteousness of Christ covers you. So now all God sees is the righteousness of Christ in you. So you say, how can, how can I be righteous but I'm not yet right? How can I be righteous but I'm not that perfect? How can I be righteous but I make mistakes? How can I be righteous but sometimes I fall? Because all God sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In order for you to have the 
righteousness, you have to accept him. And once you accept him, he covers you. Yeah. He covers you under his righteousness. See how white this towel is? You see how red that mic was? You don't see the red anymore. Come on, preacher. <laughs> you know, God doesn't see error. He doesn't see your problems. All he sees is your faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, you are made righteous. Amen. You are made righteous. Come on, clap your hands for now. Okay, now let's move on to another phase of this. Because I'm trying to help you all to understand what it, living salvation, what it means, what it means to be righteous, what it means to be holy. And holy simply means to be honest and true. To be honest and true with God. There's no sense of pretending. And I never understand when people do mess up, they stay away from church. As though God can't see you where you are when you were doing it. They act as though God can only see your sins when you come to church. But God don't just look at people while they're in church. He sees you all the time. He saw you when you did what you did. So if he wanted to strike you with a bolt of lightning, he would have been done it then. So some people think that they're going to fall dead if they come into the sanctuary. But you know where that comes from? Because under the law, if you weren't perfect and you went behind the veil, you did fall dead. <laughs> but thank God for Jesus. You can now come into the sanctuary and you'll have a duck. Because of Jesus, you are free from that. So in Jeremiah chapter 1 at verse 5, before I was formed, this is Minister Frank's favorite verse. <laughs> he quotes it all the time. Before I was formed, the, oh, excuse me, before I formed thee in thy belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Thee, and I ordained thee a prophet. Now he's talking to Jeremiah at this time. He's saying, telling Jeremiah, look, I knew you. I knew you before you were even conceived in your mother's womb. So let me ask you a question. What does that say about life, the truth of life? If God can know you before you're born, then God views life differently. And so this says something to the whole abortion thing. Despite your views, I got to speak truth. Amen. Okay? I'm not trying to be controversial with anybody. But my job is to speak truth in what's in the scripture. God is saying here that he knows every human being before they are even conceived. Amen. So when people want to say you are not alive until you are birthed out, God says something different. He said, I bought you a consciousness before you even knew what consciousness was. I knew everything about you before you even born. This is the amazing power of God because it means he knew every decision you were going to make. He knew every mistake you were going to make. He knew everything that you was going to do. He knew all of your choices, your good choices, your bad choices. He said, look, Jeremiah, I knew you before you were formed. So there is nothing that you can tell me that I don't know about you. You can't tell me I can't do it because God says, I know you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't think you can do it at this point in your life, God sees the future. Right. He sees what you're going to be and not what you are. So sometimes when you stand here and you think you're unworthy, but your unworthiness is not who you are. Your mistakes are not who you are. Your problems are not who you are. Right. Your sins are not who you are. Right. Your lack of faithfulness is not who you are. Because God knows what you're going to be. He said, before you were even born, before you were even conceived, God knew when you were going to be born. He knew the parents that you were going to be born to. So I don't want anybody to think 
that their birth was a mistake. Amen. Now hear what I'm saying? Amen. If any of you out there, I don't know who I'm talking to, if any of you out there feel like you are a mistake, I'm here to tell you you are not a mistake. Maybe your birth didn't come in the way that it should have come, but yet you are not a mistake. Because God said, I knew you before you were in the belly. I knew whose belly you were going to be in. I know who your daddy was. You ain't got to go on the show. Find out you are not the father. God knew that. Don't need no show. I knew who your daddy was before your daddy came. Y'all ain't hearing me today. He said, I knew you before you were even formed. That means he knew everything that you were going to do in life. He knew all of your mistakes. So this is why sometimes you have to learn how to turn people off. People will judge you. You know why? Because they are not God. People only see what they want to see in a person. People see only your outer appearance and they judge you from your outer appearance. But the Bible says that man looks at the outer appearance, but God is looking at the heart. So who are we to dictate anybody's salvation? Who are we to dictate where they are in their walk? All of us came from somewhere. All of us are on this journey. All of us are in this race. Some of us are at the beginning. Some of us are in the middle. Some of us are almost at the finish line. Some of us are just somewhere in between. We just fall in between the cracks. But God knows exactly where you are in the race. So who cares what people think about you and what they see on the outside? Only thing that matters is do you please God? Only thing that matters is how God sees you and not how man sees you and not how people see you. So you have no reason to be afraid to come before the presence of God. And you want to say, oh, I don't want to come to church because they might judge me. Come to church because nobody cares about man's judgment. Come on, preach it. Preach, sir. Because the only one I'm trying to please is God. Amen. And, know, and as long as God knows what's going on in me. Because he knew me. He knew everything about me. Even David said, you know my down settings and my uprising. You know all of my mistakes. You know all of my flaws. You know that I'm nervous. You know I don't like this. You know I don't like that. You know I'm a little bougie. You know I'm a little of everything. Yeah, so bougie. There is nothing God does not know about you. And there are some things that you don't even know about yourself. God knows. So nobody can be your limitation to the grace of God. No one can stop you from coming to the altar. No one can look at you and say, what you doing here? Why is she here? Why is he here? Why are you here? Because we all trying to make it to the end. We all trying to endure to the end. We're all trying to make it to meet Christ in that day. We're all trying to make it to heaven, as we say. We are all in this race together. And if we learn how to uphold each other, then we can all make it together. And in fact, one scripture says if a brother is overtaken in a fault, that we should go to him and not judge him, but go to him and pray for him or her and raise them up and bring them back. Because it's amazing when we make mistakes, it's so easy for everybody just to look over at you. It's like, hmm. Because be careful. Because just like they fell that day, you might fall the next day. Because we are all subject to failure. Y'all hear what I'm saying here today? We are all subject to failure. Now, I'm going to make it plain. I'm not trying to shout y'all today because y'all are looking for that. <laughs> I'm trying to help y'all understand some things. Now, let's go to the feet. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, saying the same thing, just in a different way. 
that I knew you before you were born, but in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to praise, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in and beloved, and whom he hath redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, God is saying he has chosen those that would be saved from the foundation, before the foundations of the world, before he framed the world, before he started creation. God, yes, he's just that powerful. That before he started creation, he knew everything about every one of us, every human being that would be saved, every human being that would do what they do. God knew that even before he framed the world, even before he started the creation process, Amen. God knew that you would be here today. God knew all of you that are in this room, all of you that are watching, God knew what you were going to be and what he was going to do for all of us according to those that he have chosen. I want you to know the day that you have been chosen by God. Despite your mistakes, despite your errors, despite what you've been through, despite what you're going through, God knows what you're going through. And if God knows what you're going through, he knows how to bring you out of what you're in. If you're feeling down, if you're feeling like, God, I can't accomplish some things. Now, can I have a little real talk with y'all real quick? A little real talk. Real talk. Sometimes we have things that are hidden, stuff that we deal with. Stuff that we're struggling with. And sometimes the stuff we're struggling with is stuff that you really can't bring yourself to tell anybody. And you don't want to tell anybody. And so you sit there and you, we, we hold it inside of us and we wonder if God is really with us. And we wonder, can I overcome this? God, can I overcome this struggle? But if God has predestined you, I want to give you hope that you will. I want you to know that God says, I know you're going to overcome this. I know you're going to get through this situation. I know you're going to get through this thing that entangles you, this thing that entraps you, the things that you sit and think about. God even knows your thoughts. He knows the stuff that you meditate about. He knows the stuff that you try to hide from people. He knows your inconsistencies. He knows your failures. He knows how you feel. He knows that part of you that is nervous, that part of you that don't like to talk around people, don't like to say a lot of things because you feel like you're out there by yourself. And sometimes you even feel forsaken. But I am here to tell you that God has predestined you. Your future has already been predestined. And I want you to know that you, in the end, you're going to win. You don't feel like you're going to win right now. You feel like a failure right now. But in the end, you're going to win. You hear what I'm saying here today? In the end, you're going to win because he has predestined you. starting at verse 29. Once again, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Yeah. God, as I said earlier, he has justified you through his blood. And you were predestined to be justified. 
So now in verse 31, he says, what shall then we say unto these things? What things? Whatever things you're going through, whatever situation you are in, whatever is going on in your heart, whatever's going on in your mind, what shall we say then to these things? What shall we say to the devil that wants to tell you that you're no good, that you can't make it, that devil that wants you to give up, that devil that wants to tell you you can't do this, you can't be saved. Look at the things that you've done. Look at your life. You're not worthy of this. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Because we were predestined. And what you have to learn how to do is quote scripture. Because when the enemy comes against you, all you have to say, you know what, devil, that's all right, I was predestined. You know what? Your, your people enemies. You have a devil enemy and you have people enemies. So you can say to your people enemies, guess what? I was predestined. Look at me. Judge me all you want to, but I'm predestined. Say what you want to say, but I can come in here boldly before the throne of Christ. Say what you got to say about me. Don't care. Because God told me I was predestined. God told me he chose me. And so he, he says... What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Come on and give God some praise in this place. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. God is for all of us. Because we have been predestined. And his salvation works for all of us. From the time of Adam up until now, his blood still works. I hear what I'm saying here today? Because I'm trying to help y'all to understand this. Now, after all that, we said, you know that God has predestined you. So you might say, well, preacher, now what? Because I still got to live this life. We still got to live holy. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be whole and true. It means to be honest with God. Tell him what's going on in your life. You know, it's funny because the world has told us how to get over our habits. And we go to these AA meetings and these drug meetings. And what's the one thing they tell you to do is to first of all admit what's wrong with you. And we have been trained to not to hide what's wrong with us. Because we, if we feel like if we tell or reveal what's wrong with us, we feel like we're going to be judged. Because that's what people do. When you try to confide in people and tell them, look, man, I got this going on, people judge you. And sometimes you don't even have to say anything. People judge you just by the way you look. They judge you by your tattoos. They judge you by your ear, ear piercings. They judge you by the clothes that you have or don't have. People will judge you. So we hide. So we keep it in. And holiness just means I'm going to be honest with God. Like, God, you know what? I ain't got it all together. I'm not right all the time. You know how we say God is good all the time and all the time God is good? God, I'm bad all the time and all the time I'm bad. God wants you to be honest with him. He wants you to be true. That's what it means to be holy is to be true, it's to be honest, to be who you are. Because God is who he is, and that's what makes him holy. God is righteous, and that's what makes him holy. Amen. There is no sin in him, and that is who he is. So when he says, be ye holy, for I am holy, what he's saying is, be truthful, because I'm true. Be true to yourself. And come to him and say, God, I got this issue. God, I got this problem that I can't overcome. And... I'm not, I can't hide this anymore. God, you know everything about me. You know the worst things of me. Lord God, you know what I've done. But God, I come before you. And that's his, when he says confess, I'm confessing to you, God. I'm not all right. I'm not all there. But God, I need you to save me. God, I need you to use me. What's the one prophet said when he walked in and he felt unworthy? He said, God, I am unworthy. And the angel came and took the coals off the altar and touched it to his mouth. He says, now your sins and your iniquities have been forgiven. Whatever's wrong with you, God knows how to fix you. Not people. 
Because people will try to conform you to them. People will try to make you conform to their sense of righteousness and what they think is right. But the only thing that matters is God's righteousness for you. Yes. And what God has for you is for you, the individual. All of us are on this walk, and this is what you must understand. Everybody's salvation is not the same, but yet it is. It's the same because we are all saved by Christ. We are all saved by faith. But our walk is different. Where we come from is different. Our situations are different. Our scenarios are different. So you cannot judge one another because we're all in different places in our life. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Maybe you have overcome some things, but just because you've overcome it and that person has not overcome it does not mean that you are more saved than what they are. Amen. You just got a head start. And that's the one difference about a marathon than a sprint race. The Bible says the race is not given to the swift nor the strong, but those that endure to the end. A marathon is all about endurance. Amen. It's not about somebody getting to the finish line first. It's all about endurance. And salvation walk is just like a marathon. It's all about being able to endure to the end. It's not about how fast you got there. It's not about when you got saved and somebody else got saved. It is the endurance that we have to overcome. It is our ability to survive. It's our ability that we fall, we get back up. You see people in marathons, sometimes they trip and fall but they get back up. You will fall sometimes. You will trip sometimes. But God is there to help you back up. God is there to pick you back up. Because he's not concerned with how fast you run. He's not concerned with what you got and who you think you are. What he's concerned about is can you make it to the end? And in order to make it, you might ask what now? I'm on this race. Does sometimes our character matter? Yes. yes. Should we dress like we represent Christ? Yes. But nobody can determine what you should or should not look like. Right. Because what salvation is, what holiness is, what holy living is, is not about your perfection. What it's about is you managing yourself. Learning how to grow. Learning how to have perform flesh management. Learning over time. Learning that, okay, this didn't work. I'm not going to do that again. When I went this way, I messed up, so I'm not going to go that way again. I tried this, that didn't work, so I'm not going to do that again. It's all about trial and error, just like life is. There are some things in life that you have to go through trial and error, and God has enough grace for your error. He has enough grace for you to mess up a few times until you get it right. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And I have just enough grace because in one scripture he said to the riches, the abundance of the riches of his grace. He is abundance in grace. So that means it doesn't matter how many times you mess up, he still has grace enough for you. So go ahead and try it. Go ahead and not be afraid. Go ahead and say that, yes, I am holy and I'm living for God. Maybe you might mess up sometimes. Maybe you might have some oops in your life. Maybe you might have some errors in your life. But you know what? I'm trying to work this out. Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't look at me now. Don't look at me now. I'm just trying to work it out. I'm just trying to work this thing out. Yeah, I know you might be looking at me crazy right now because I came here acting crazy, looking crazy, looking strange. But don't worry about me. I'm just trying to work it out. I'm just trying to weed this thing out. I'm trying to feel my way through this. It gets dark sometimes, and sometimes you just got to feel your way through it until you get to the light. And as you see the light, walk therein. When God gets you to the point where he can perfect you, and he will, walk therein. Walk in your perfection because he has predestined you. Walk in your perfection perfection, until you get there. Because it's all about managing yourself. It's all about examining yourself. Lord, how can I be better today? It ain't about what people think. How can you be better for God today? What can you do different today? 
How can I change my situation? If I keep walking over the shoe and I keep tripping over it, what should I do? Oh, I know, I'll stop and pick it up. Because that's what insanity is. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's insanity. And some of us have to get a little crazy to get righteous. <laughs> because after a while, you know what, ain't nothing changing. Maybe I should pick this shoe up and I'll start bumping my head and I'll stop bumping my head. Maybe I'll stop doing this and maybe things will change. That's what holy living is. That's what being righteous is. That's what sanctification is, which sanctification just means that you have been set aside. You have been set aside for God's purpose. And God is not concerned about who you are and your mistakes because he is able to keep you from falling. He is able to fix you. He is able to deliver you. Y'all hear what I'm saying? He is able. How many of you know in here God is able? How many out there watching know that God is able? I want you to know that you can make this thing. You can make it to the end of the race. You don't have to be swift. You don't have to be strong. All you have to do is to endure and make it to the end. Y'all hear what I'm telling y'all in here today. I want you to know that you can do this, that you can succeed. Those of you out there, don't matter what's going on with you. God knows you. God sees you. God wants you. He desires for you to come to him. He desires for you to do the things that he wants you to do. He desires for you to make it to the end. Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands. Come on and clap your hands. There it is. He wants you to make it. He wants you to get to the end. He wants you to endure. Because God has sent his son. And he came down here. Came to live among men. Show them righteousness. Show them the way. Show them forgiveness. And then he humbled himself to death. He humbled himself to the cross. And because he humbled himself to the cross, this is how he predestined us. And because he humbled himself to the cross, he allowed himself to be the ultimate sacrifice. And when he was the ultimate sacrifice, he went into the grave. Now what did he do in the grave? He preached to the souls that have already been been dead. He preached to those that were down there in the pit. He preached to those that were down there in the grave. And he gave them opportunity and showed them that I am the prophecy. I am the fulfillment of all things. All those things that Jeremiah talked about. All those things that Isaiah talked about. All those things in the past that Moses talked about. All the prophecies of, the, of, of King David. I am he. And he told the souls that. And they received him. Hallelujah. And then when he got done with that work, he got back up again. And he finished the work. Because if it wasn't for the resurrection, the salvation process wouldn't have worked. If it had not been for Christ, none of us would be saved. If it had not been for Christ, everything we do is in vain. If Christ was not raised from the dead, everything we do is in vain. But oh, I assure you, he was raised from the dead. Because of that, we have been predestined. Because of that, if you can believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God did raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Come on and stand to your feet. Clap your hands and let's give God praise. Give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ this day.
truly believe that in your heart. And now that you believe that, you are saved. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we glorify you right now. Lord, we thank you for these men that have chosen to come before you today, oh God. They have chosen to give their life to you, God. And we pray for them right now, oh God. In the name of Jesus, that you touch them, Lord. Give them increase, oh God. Touch their hearts and their minds. Let them receive the Spirit. Let them receive, receive the Holy Ghost on this day. So they might lead and guide them. In the name of Jesus, receive the Spirit. Receive the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. He will help you. He will remind you of all things. He will give you grace and peace. He will speak to you, and he will lead and guide you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands. Thank you.